Welcome to Hawthorne University's webinar series. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and it's my pleasure to facilitate this presentation on heavy metals and tinnitus. And we'll certainly save time at the end of the presentation for your questions and your comments. So I encourage you just to add them to the webinar panel anytime during the presentation, and I'll pose them for you at the end. And I encourage you to keep your eyes on the webinar chat box, too, because Alex is so good about posting details there that uh, help you not to have to write down so many things. So today, Hawthorne welcomes Sean Favre to present tinnitus and heavy metals connecting the dots. Our bodies are challenged to tolerate chemical toxicity, and, and this often leads to a list of chronic conditions that can go unexplained, like adrenal fatigue and chronic tinnitus. So Sean's going to detail how these unseen heavy metal invaders affect our body's communication pathways all the way down to the cell level and then be connecting um, between tinnitus and adrenal fatigue. So we'll discover how to achieve safe and effective results while addressing the cause but not the symptoms. I'm going to let you know a little bit about Sean. Um, he's the founder of Geared for Wellness, and he earned his bachelor's degree in behavioral science from the University of Colorado. He's a certified health coach, um, a health centers of the future graduate, and he holds a pastoral science diplomat from Pastoral Medical Association, and he's a member of the NAMP too. Sean has over 20 years of experience in the natural health care profession, and for the past 11 years, he's practiced as a neurotoxicity specialist. He works directly with health professionals throughout the United States and is a soft after um, wellness coach, consultant, and lecturer. Sean trains practitioners all across the country to implement programs that bring much needed health and wellness to their communities and his desire is that we go about life with less stress and more joy by helping remove the toxic interference and providing the nutritional tools that a body needs. Well, with a mission statement like that, Sean, um, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. And I want to turn it over to you because I imagine you've got a plethora of information to share with us. Indeed, I do, Paula. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to give this talk, excited to be here. And I'm thankful for you and, and Hawthorne University for hosting this this talk and, and so I I'm just super excited I'm I'm grateful to be here thank you uh, so yeah as yeah. as the the title says you know tinnitus and heavy metals and what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a little journey uh, through the human body to connect the dots of what tinnitus is and and I, I've gained a whole new understanding of of tinnitus and what I believe uh, the reason for tinnitus is I think it actually has a reason it's not just a problem I think that there's actually a reason for it so we're going to connect all these dots as we go through the body and, and, and figure out exactly what the mechanism is that uh, that links heavy metals toxicity to uh, tinnitus to chronic tinnitus and of course you know what is tinnitus tinnitus basically is hearing sounds that aren't there you, you have this chronic tone that you're hearing but there's no physical sound that exists it's just something that's a, a simulated sound that's being projected into your uh, brain from your ear nerves um, <clears throat> so how common is it well over 45 million people in the United States struggle with tinnitus that's huge that's 14 percent of the population uh, I think there's uh, that's a pretty good uh, client base that we can draw from anyone could implement something like this in their business 67% um, of those, they have regular symptoms for over a year. That's a long time. Some people for many, many years, but even a year is a long time. 26% uh, of those have constant or near constant tinnitus where they hear it all the time unless there's some sort of background noise drowning it out. And 30% of those 45 million, so we're talking 15 million people, uh, will classify it as moderate or a very big problem in their life. So there's a there's a need to address this and and really to understand what's going on. When you got 20 million Americans dealing with burdensome tinnitus on a regular basis, and even this number astounded me, two million people are struggling with severe to even debilitating tinnitus. So it's a big problem. It's a it's a much bigger problem than most people would imagine. Um, so. <clears throat> I look at systemic tinnitus. We're not going to be talking tonight about the ringing in the ear, like from from like a you know going to a, a loud concert or having a gun shot off next to your head or something. We're talking about primarily systemic tinnitus and how it's connected to all these different uh, degenerative changes. And and if you look, uh, there's a there's a we're going to do a lot of connecting tonight. I love the the, the title. Paul actually came up with that, the connecting the dots part, but that's really what we're doing here. Uh, you look at how it's it's related to diabetes, hypertension, rheumatic disease, kidney and thyroid gland diseases, and all of these dysfunctions can be related back to the same thing. I believe that that uh, tinnitus is not 
caused by these health conditions, but both of these health conditions and the tinnitus are a result of what's going on in our body systemically at the, all the way down to uh, the cell level. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at all these different components, right? We have the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Those are in your brain. The adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys. We're going to look down to the nerves, the, all the way down into the nerve, into the cell. And we're going to look all the way down into the receptors that are on the cell. So we're going to take a very, we're going to take a, a macro and a very microscopic look at the mechanism behind what causes tinnitus. So we'll start with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus says at the base of your skull, it's, uh, it's, it's your control tower for, for hormonal function. If you look at this, this diagram here, you see all these arrows, and it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's a graph that I've been using for many years, and, and it basically is saying, look, the hypothalamus is responsible for all these different uh, hormonal uh, um, processes in your body. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this, and I'm going to be talking about you. So you see the hypothalamus there kind of in the center to the right there. Um, and it's got these little black nodules all over it, and those represent leptin receptors. Now, leptin has nothing to do with your adrenals or with tinnitus or anything, but I'm using leptin. I, I, I want to drive home a point by using leptin to explain a, a different process. So leptin, and, and this actually, this will be great information that if you don't, if you're not familiar with leptin, this will be something that you can learn more about. I would highly recommend you understand leptin, especially if you work with people when it comes to weight loss, uh, but anything dealing with hormones. So leptin was discovered back in the 1990s, and they realized that this is the hormone that tells the body to burn fat. And they thought, man, we found the holy grail of weight loss. If we can bottle this up, you know, we can sell this and, and people are going to be losing weight. And, you know, I'm sure they're all thinking how they're going to be billionaires at this point. And so just like with any other hormone, if you want to prescribe a hormone to somebody, you need to be able to show them an objective finding, a, a lab result. This is, look, you're low in leptin, so you need leptin. That's your problem. That's what weight. So they developed a, a leptin test to test the body's levels of leptin. And what they found turned everything completely upside down. They expected you're an obese person, you're going to have no leptin in your body because you can't burn fat. But what they found was exactly the opposite, that people who were the more obese, the more obese a person was, the higher their leptin levels were. There was a direct correlation there. Lean, fit people had very little leptin in their body. And of course, that kind of threw everything off and they well, what do we, you know, what do we do with this now? So they had to dig deeper. And what they discovered was you have these leptin receptors on your hypothalamus. And when you get like at the very top there, it says cytokines, you get an overactive cytokine response, you get inflammation, you have toxicity, you have all these things going on. It creates this chronic state of inflammation around those receptors and those receptors get blunted. And now they can no longer hear leptin. Leptin's floating around the body going, where do I, where do I land? I can't, it has nowhere to connect because those receptors are broken. And so your body loses the ability to burn fat. Now that's important for a lot of reasons, but another reason why this is very important, if you look at the, towards the bottom of my red oval there, uh, you'll see something, this is low MSH. So the body utilizes leptin to burn fat, but it also takes leptin and it converts it into MSH, which is the melanocyte stimulating hormone. And that hormone now becomes the master hormone of all hormone functions. It's like the general mad dog mattis of hormones. It tells everybody what to do. And when that's low, when you don't have enough MSH in your body, everything else, just like removing the general from the army, everything else goes into disarray and chaos. And so your sleep gets off, your diuretic get off, pain gets off, you get sick more often, on and on. All the hormones get out of balance because you no longer have a general control on things. So that concept of, of leptin, leptin receptors being blunted and the hormone leptin not being able to dock itself onto the hypothalamus is important. We're going to learn more about that all the way down to the cell level and how that affects our ability to use hormones at the cell level. So the next, we have the hypothalamus. Now we go to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is like your secondary control tower. It sends out messages to all these different organs. You know, you, you've got your thyroid, uh, you've got your adrenals, of course, which is what we're going to be talking about. Um, even oxytocin. You want to be in love, you need to have a good pituitary functioning pituitary gland, all right? So all of these different Hormone functions are directed by the pituitary in response from the hypothalamus. So then we go to the next step down, and that's the adrenal glands. The adrenals sit right on top of your kidneys. 
Uh, so you have two of them. And, and if you look at the diagram, the little circle there towards the bottom right, this is the cortex and the medulla. Right. The medulla, when you say the word medulla, it's, it's, it's basically what it does is it, it tells you um, that you're able to um, differentiate the inside of an organ from the outside of an organ. So it's, it's made of like a different material. If you open it up, it would look different. So you have inside of the adrenal gland, you have the medulla, and that, that's going to be important also uh, as we get further down and we talk more about heavy metals and, and so on. So the HPA axis, what I just described to you, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, it also relates to things like thyroid, uh, your gonads and ovaries, other hormonal functions, as we talked about in that last slide as well. Uh, so you, when you see all these little circles here, there's these little black starbursts on top of the thyroid, adrenal, gonads, and ovaries, and even on top of the, the hormones below those. Those represent mercury. I've always used those as a representation of mercury, and mercury attaches itself. It creates this chronic state of inflammation. It gets into the nerves, and it actually disrupts the communication. So the pituitary is no longer able to communicate back and forth with your adrenal glands, and so now you have a disruption in function and a dysregulation of hormones. So that, and that's with several different uh, operations there, but we are specifically looking at the HPA axis in relation to the adrenals. And so a little lesson on adrenals. Um, most people think, you know, I'm stressed. I, I you know, I, I produce cortisol. I have this. They, all the, most people would relate it to stress. If you asked your clients, the vast majority of them would never think that it had anything to do with uh, blood sugar, with controlling your, your blood sugar levels, but it very much has a, 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 a huge part to play in that. So when your blood sugar drops, you actually release cortisol from your adrenal glands. Cortisol activates both glucose and fats, so it keeps your body fueled because we need, we need to have both sources of energy. Uh, cortisol increases the blood sugar level, so now you've you got to drop. The cortisol releases it, then insulin moves in and drives it into the cell. So your body can absorb glucose and the mitochondria can use that to create ATP for energy. However, when we have a long-term stress, both the insulin and the cortisol remain, remain elevated and then you end up with extra glucose and that gets stored as fat. And then that's when what we find is insulin goes up, leptin goes up and people lose the ability to burn fat. And what we've got there is not just a person who can't lose weight, but a person who has massive hormone dysregulation. And that needs to be addressed all the way down to the cell level. So we're looking at stress and we're looking at hormones, how the stress is affecting the hormones. And so a stress, whether it's physical, emotional, or chemical, and I've been doing this for about 11 years now. And in almost every case, one of the stressors is emotional. Um, in most cases, it's all three of them, but you can have emotional and physical or emotional and chemical. And of course, chemical stressors in, in regards to today's talk is going to be those toxins, uh, those toxins that we're talking about. So stress induces the secretion of the CRH from the hypothalamus. That CRH stimulates in turn the secretion of ACTH from the pituitary gland. Okay, so this, this, this communication is important. And then finally, the ACTH gets into the bloodstream and that causes secretion of your stress hormone from the adrenal glands. So the stress hormones, you have two main ones. You have the glucocorticoids and you have the mineralocorticoids. Um, so think cortisol for glucose. Think gluco as in glucose, right? Glucocorticoids, cortisol. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory as well as helping control sugar. So it, it's crucial that your body is able to utilize cortisol to drive down inflammation. Again, you're going to see a lot of this is circled around inflammation. However, aldosterone is pro-inflammatory. It actually leads to, it actually creates inflammation. And that's going to be key to understanding tinnitus and the mechanics behind tinnitus, okay? So now we have all these nerves that run through our whole body. And there's some pictures of the nerves on the side of the face. And we know that toxins uh, have an affinity for fat, uh, biotoxins, heavy metals, especially mercury. They love binding to fat, and we know that our nerve cells are made primarily of fat, especially your myelin sheath. It's just pure fat. In fact, your brain is fat. Your nerves are fat. There's a lipid bilayer around your every single cell that's made of fat, and we're talking cholesterol and saturated fats. These are, these are healthy fats that we need in our diet. And, and so when someone wants to go on a low-fat diet or take cholesterol-reducing drugs, the impact that it's having on their brain and their nervous system is huge because we need those good fats to build healthy cells and to build healthy nerves and to have a healthy functioning brain. So we look at 
I love this quote for a couple of reasons. One is this actually keyed me into something about tinnitus that I wasn't thinking about good finding as I was doing this research. Um, and so that's one reason I love this quote, but the other reason is it's from a, a study done back in 1907. So it's kind of cool to quote somebody from doing this, you know, from over a hundred years ago. And it also lets us know, you know, this is not a new problem. You know, this has been around for a while. So he's talking about the geniculate ganglion, which is a bundle of nerves. I'm going to show you here in just a second. It sits right up on top of the auditory canal. And what he says is the most interesting as well as the most severe types of disease occur when the acoustic nerve is also involved. And that statement right there, I had to read that a few times before it, it clicked, is when a disease, these certain diseases get more severe, now you have this acoustic nerve becoming involved. You know, when it's a mild form of whatever this disease is, you don't get the tinnitus, you don't get the ringing. And he puts, you know, some of these arranging in from tinnitus, to a diminution of the hearing or more severe forms of acoustic involvement as seen in Meniere's syndrome. And we know that in Meniere's uh, directly correlated is uh, the inflammation of the geniculate ganglion. And so the more severe a disease is, the more you're gonna get a tinnitus type reaction. Okay, so that geniculate, and again, it's also Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is another one that uh, inflammation of the geniculate ganglion is implicated as a, a, a symptom. You know, it's a, they, they call it a symptom of disease. Again, I think that they're two separate things that are caused by the same common problem, and that, of course, is toxicity and inflammation. So that big, fat bundle of nerves right there sits right on top of your auditory canal. And, and it's important to understand that, that it's such a large collection. It's a, heavy metals, mercury especially, loves to hang out in fats, at fat cells, and in nerve cells. And so it's easy. You're going to remember this geniculate ganglion here a little bit later. It's easy to see how this could get overstimulated by toxicity from mercury. And I'm going to be talking later about mercury specifically. So um, inner ear receptors we have inside of our ear. The HPA-induced steroids signal through their respective receptors is what this says. So glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid receptors, right? So now the, the glucocorticoid receptors are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're all throughout your body. And so obviously we need, because we need anti-inflammatory uh, properties everywhere, okay? But here's the thing that, that I found interesting. The mineralocorticoid receptors... Those are exclusive to the brain, eye, and tell you all these ones. But the pituitary gland, again, that's key for this, and the inner ear. The inner ear is loaded with these mineralocorticoid receptors, which I said are inflammatory. And 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 that to me was was something that I racked in my brain for quite a while before I figured out why that is. Matter of fact, um, the analysis expressed sequence tag profile, the highest expression level of mineral corticoid receptors, that's M as in messenger RNA, is in the inner ear. Why, I'm, I'm always a why guy, ask the questions, why would we be designed in such a way that we have this high concentration of these receptors in our inner ear that are going to lead to inflammation, right? And we know that the non-genomic, meaning not dealing with the genome effects of stress, are attributed to the pres presence of these mineralocorticoid receptors, uh, which also expressed in the cochlea. Again, that's right in the middle of your ear. So there's a picture of your inner ear. The blue thing in the middle, that's your cochlea, the little spirally part in there. That has, of course, the spiral ganglion. The spiral ganglion, again, is, is just a bundle of nerves right there inside the cochlea. Okay, so right there in the middle of the inner ear. In the prefrontal cortex, stress has been shown to activate a glucocorticoid-inducible kinase SGK. That is, SGK1 is also expressed in the stria vascularis, which I want to show you a picture of, and also in the spiral ganglion, which you just got to see. And so, oh, and the last thing, yes, not surprisingly, this one, I love this, mineral corticoid receptors was found to be predominantly localized in the stria vascularis, again, in the inner ear and in the spiral ganglion neurons. Okay, so the spiral ganglion is in that, that kind of towards the middle. It's been circled in red there. And then the stria vascularis is that area that's been circled on the left. And that's a soft tissue inside the inner ear canal. Um, if you look to the right, you'll see the picture here 
of your inner ear, uh, the, the, the outer hair cells. You know, when, when you think, okay, I went to a loud concert and I get home and it's nice and quiet and I lay down in bed and my ears are ringing. They've never been ringing before. And all of a sudden my ears are ringing. Well, they're ringing because this was overstimulated. The music was too loud. And so now you've created an inflammatory situation. You've, you've overstimulated those nerves. And so these nerves, the spiral ganglion, all of the nerves that go to the outer hair cells, those, those stereocilia, you know, they all come together. All those nerves inside, they, they all come together and, and they form that bundle, that spiral ganglion. They do one thing, they sense sound. And so if they're being stimulated, they don't sense pain, they don't sense temperature or anything like that. They sense the sound and that's the only thing they know how to send a signal for. So if they're being overstimulated, if there's a problem, it's going to send out an auditory signal. There's, even though that doesn't exist, it's, it's sending the only kind of signal it knows. So you hear this chronic tone telling you, hey, you have a problem. There's inflammation here. And with most people, it's, you know, it's going to be a transitory thing from going to a concert. They went out to the gun range and didn't wear proper ear protection or whatever. Um, cortisol. Now, I, I'm talking about a little bit about elevated cortisol and what that means, but I want to read these, these little quotes here first. Um, salivary cortisol are chronically elevated in tinnitus patients for people who have had disturbing tinnitus for an average of five and a half years, okay? So we know that cortisol levels are chronically elevated, and that's key. The question is, why are they elevated? Um, patients who have had tinnitus for a longer time, an average of 14.7 years, were shown to develop an improper HPA response, that hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal response. Whenever uh, they were given an experimental psychosocial stress, the, they had an improper response. Basically, their HPA axis is not working the way it should. And the HPA axis in tinnitus patients under stress is activated later than normal and at a lesser degree than is normal. So you have a delayed reaction in your uh, um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal connection, and it's a declined function as well. And again, this is consistent with those glucocorticoid inefficiency, right? You're, you're basically not able to address your, or your body's not able to uh, um, manage its, its glucocorticoids. And so why is that? Now we're having this elevated level of cortisol in our body. We've got an HPA axis that because it's loaded with toxicity and inflammation can't communicate with each other. How does this all tie into this ringing in the ear and, and the hormone receptors that we have. Well, you have your, your cell, okay? This is a human cell. It's got the nucleus in the middle. Uh, around the outside of it is that lipid bilayer that I talked about, and I'm going to show you a little bit of more of a picture cross section of that on the next slide. Um, matter of fact, that, that lipid bilayer is so important for cell function that they've actually taken the nucleus of the cell out of cells, and the cell will continue to live for a short while, it can't repair itself, can't really function well, but it will continue to live and do well for a short while. But if you take the lipid bilayer off, you take that cell membrane off, the cell instantly dies, okay? It's, it's, it's that, that critical. So what we're seeing is toxins building up, as you see on the bottom left side of the picture there, you've got these little skulls and crossbones and little, you know, kind of inflammatory response. Well, when that becomes chronic and that you lead to a state of chronic inflammation around that cell, toxins were building up. You, uh, you know, I think you go back to what I said about our lipid bilayer, bilayer being made up of saturated fats and cholesterol. Well, if you're eating a diet with um, hydrogenated oils or trans fats, all these corn oils, you know, all these different things that your body really doesn't need and is damaging to your body, and it tries to use those to, to repair that, that cell membrane, well, now you've created even more inflammation. You've created more. You've got a you've got a, a, a cellular wall that can't do its job, and it's going to let bad stuff in. It's going to keep bad stuff in there. Like you know, when you produce ATP from your mitochondria, just like anyone else that produces energy, you're going to produce a waste product. Well, if your cell membrane is all gunked up and and congested and inflamed, then that waste product can't get out. You can't get the good stuff in to your cell to help repair it, and so reducing the, the toxic load and the cellular inflammation at down to the cell level is key. Uh, matter of fact, it's, it's so important that even Time Magazine, you know, the mainstream media has caught on to it. You know, when inflammation becomes chronic rather than transitory, it's a problem. Transitory inflammation is good. There's a cycle that you have to go through, 
when you're dealing with inflammation and it needs to go to its completion. Well, when it gets stuck and it doesn't go to that completion, when it doesn't resolve itself, that's when you, you develop all these chronic conditions and it gets worse and it gets worse and worse. And, and I, I forgot, gosh, I was watching a show that was a group of medical doctors and I was getting so excited. I was watching this. They, they said, the root of all modern health conditions is inflammation. I'm like, yes, they're right. I agree. And they said, so what we need to do is address the inflammation. I said, yes, I agree. And I was hoping they were going to go, what we need to do is address what's causing the inflammation. Instead, they said, we need more anti-inflammatory. So I was completely deflated, but at least they understand the importance of inflammation. What we do as natural practitioners is we address the root cause. At least that's what I do. And I, I think most people on this listening to this recording are the same way. Um, or I guess it's going to be a recording. It's not recorded yet. We're live. So here's here's the exciting part. Here's where it gets exciting, and I love this, right? So you've got this lipid bilayer, and you've got all these receptors, and if that lipid bilayer, like I said, is inflamed and congested, and those receptors are blunted, and those receptors hear all hormones, right? It's not just it's not just your your, your you know cortisol. It's insulin. It's leptin. It's estrogen. It's testosterone. It's all of your hormones. You have to dock onto these receptors on the cell. And so when one is dysregulated from inflammation, they're all going to be dysregulated. It's just, it's inevitable. And so when I stopped and I started thinking about this, the question that I, I'm going to go back to now was having these receptors all throughout your body are important, but why is it? And this was the question that I was racking in my brain for quite a while until I finally, the light came on. Why is it? that we have in our inner ear the highest concentration of these mineralocorticoid receptors when those are inflammatory. What would be the purpose of that? And that's the question that kept running through my mind. And I, and I, and I, I couldn't understand. I'm like, why would you want to create a state of inflammation? With that many receptors, you can be inflamed and you can have all the toxicity in the world and you're still going to make something connect. It's like it was like intentionally built that way. And all of a sudden, my brain went, oh, wow, it was intentionally built that way. Because now that inflamed nerve bundle in your ear, the, that, that spiral ganglia that is loaded with all of these mineralocorticoid receptors, it can't hear glucose. I'm sorry, not glucose. It, um, it can't hear cortisol. So it can't reduce its own inflammation, but it can still connect with the mineralocorticoids, which are going to create more inflammation. And all of a sudden I went, this is it. This is exciting. This is like an alarm system built into your head that lets you know that you have a problem and you need to address it. It's like the smoke detector in your house. And this smoke detector, you can't take the batteries out of it. You know, you've got to fix the problem. And not only is it going to keep going, it's going to keep getting louder. Just like it looks like those, those studies that we saw. You know, people who have had tinnitus for five years, you know, they've got elevated cortisol. People who've had it for 15 years have, you know, an improper HPA response. And the longer you have it, the more your HPA is declined and delayed in its function. It's a metabolic issue that needs to be addressed. And all of a sudden, we have this sound system in our head that nobody else can hear but us telling us, man, five alarm fire going on here. You need to fix this. You need to put out these fires because if you don't, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. And, you know, whether that was, I don't you know, if that's an intentional thing, you know, for, for us to have this alarm system, but it's a great byproduct of however it works. But I can't think of any other reason. If you can come up with a better reason why we'd have pro-inflammatory receptors mashed into such a small area in our ear, I'd love to hear it. But I don't know of any other reason. I've not seen anybody else give any other good reason for it. And so when you're dealing with a tinnitus patient, the first thing you want to tell them is, you know what, we're going to address your tinnitus, but you need to understand that that tinnitus is indicative of a much deeper problem. This is your body telling you that you have a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed at a systemic level and all the way down to the cell level. We need to reduce that inflammation so your body can start using those hormones so the HPA axis can start communicating with itself. And that to me was so, when I, when I put all this together from all these research papers that I, I found, it, 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 was, it was like I had discovered gold or something. It was so exciting to me to think that this is an amazing process that your body is literally telling you 
when you need to fix it. We just need to learn to listen. And in this case, it's so important that it makes you listen. You don't have a choice. So the question that I get is, you know, where do all these toxins come from, right? Uh, I, I, every time I sit down with someone and I say, yeah, you're toxic, you've got this and you've got that, or maybe we run a heavy metals test on them, they, I always get the question, where did I get this from? Well, simply put, this, these toxins are everywhere. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, my son, uh, part, of, part of my journey, and I won't get into the story, but just to tell you, um, you know, kind of what we're dealing with in our, in our country, my son, when he was little, he came down with asthma. And uh, he was never vaccinated. Uh, he had never been to a medical doctor for anything in his life. You know, he was a super healthy kid. The only health problem he's ever had was asthma. And it took us years to get it under control. It really did. You know, I didn't understand the human body as well. You know, he's 21 now. You know, he was, I think, three or four when it started. And I understand things a lot better now. We were able to finally get his asthma under control. But uh, a few years ago, I read a report from the National Institute of asthma and allergies or something like that. And they do a, a, a check every year of all the 100 major or 100 largest cities in the country. And the worst city in the world, I'm sorry, in the, in the world, in the country, the worst city in the United States to live if you have asthma and allergies is Wichita, Kansas. And that's where his asthma develops. And the reason you would think, gosh, it's the middle of Kansas. It should be clean air. No, we're loaded with pesticides here. So you, you're not going to find clean air anywhere in the country maybe way up in the mountaintops, and that's about it. Um, and it gets worse because not only is the air outside dirty, but the EPA estimates two to five times more pollution in your home. And the reason is for that is, you know, back in the, you know, up until the, you know, later part of the 1900s, houses when they were built, you know, I've lived in old homes before, you know, the windows leak, you know, air comes in through the bottom of the door, you know, there's drafty parts of the home, you know, you've got the attics are really not well insulated and on and on. So they, the houses breathe. So the air outside came in and the air inside went out. And so you have this circulation Well, we're building houses airtight now, you know, in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the name of, of better insulation. Well, what we've done is we've created this closed off environment where now the average person in this country is washing their, the, the most toxic thing you can do is the dishwasher. You put these chemicals in the dishwasher and you ever open it up and that big puff of steam comes out. Well, this thing is off gassing all these chemicals. You know, we're using laundry detergents. People have perfumes and colognes and, and hairspray and they're spraying in their house and, and all that furniture, that new furniture that you got and the, the carpet is all off gassing and your house is just loaded with toxins. So just that alone. Um, and, and, you know, we know that eliminating these toxins will have a much greater impact on our health. We know that toxins Toxicity is a bad thing, and it needs to be addressed. So it's not just outside toxins. It's what we're doing to ourselves, even inside of our bodies. Mercury is, if I did nothing else but detox people for heavy metals, I would be a happy guy because I've seen the best results from people who detox for heavy metals. It fixes all these other systemic problems. You know, if you, come with, you can have someone come in to you who has adrenal fatigue and may not be heavy metals toxic. There could be other causes for it. But you can have a person who's heavy metals toxic. It may not show adrenal fatigue, but they're going to have adrenal dysregulation. They're going to have a whole lot of other hormonal dysregulations. And just simply detoxing them from metal is going to remove all of that interference so their body can communicate with itself the way it's supposed to. So mercury is the second most toxic substance on the face of the planet. And, of course, I always get asked this question, what's the most toxic? It's uranium. So you've got to go radiation in order to get worse than Mercury and mercury. I've seen the, the the footage of where they take the mercury and they put it on nerve endings, and it literally eats away your nerves. It dissolves them, and and especially what it does to the myelin sheath. When you think of stuff like autism and uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, think of myelin sheath, multiple sclerosis. Think of myelin sheath damage, and mercury is going to definitely be involved in that. Uh, so it, it's just a very dangerous, dangerous uh, substance. So top three sources of mercury, amalgam, the, the, of course, the medical association and the dental association would love for you to believe that fish is your only real source of mercury and it's your most dangerous source when in fact it is not. Um, amalgam fillings are the number one source. Fish are second. Vaccinations are third. Um, they, they are taking, of course, they 
climb up and down and they, they you know, will tell you to the end of the earth that mercury is perfectly safe, but for some reason they decided to take it out of the vaccines because of public outcry or whatever the case might be. Uh, but vaccinations, some of them still have the mercury in them. And even the ones where they've taken mercury out, uh, they still have aluminum and all other kind of toxins in them. Uh, so mercury is just, it's, we've way overused it in our culture and it's, it's creating all kinds of problems. Um, it was found that amalgam fillings cause deposition of mercury in the following tissues. Look at that spinal ganglia. What are the odds that that one would be in there? The anterior pituitary, again, part of your HPA, the adrenal and the medulla inside the adrenal glands. All right. So your whole HPA axis is thrown off because of mercury and your spinal ganglia is now chronically inflamed because of mercury, right? So, so now it's it's got double reasons to be inflamed and screaming at you with tinnitus. It's got heavy metals toxicity, and it's causing itself to be inflamed because of all of these mineralocorticoid receptors that are binding onto all of these uh, mineralocorticoids that are put out by the adrenals. Um, we know that amalgam fillings are considered a hazardous material. When they come to the dentist's office, they're in a sealed container that says it has to be handled in a specific way. Uh, when they take it out of your mouth, there's, you know, they have to put it in a specific container. They can't, you know, it's, they can't touch it. It's gotta be stored under liquid so that it doesn't evaporate. It doesn't off gas. It's considered a hazardous waste. But for some reason in between those two steps, when it's in your teeth, it's perfectly acceptable. And, and that's the part that I just don't really uh, understand I'm not able to wrap my mind around but the fact is if you want to see something really fascinating go on YouTube and search for uh, the smoking tooth or smoking teeth video you'll see it it's got a great a bright green fluorescent background it's pretty obvious which one it is um, uh, watch that you'll see exactly how much these amalgam fillings they use a 25 year old amalgam filling and show you how much it's still puts off mercury vapors. And I will caution you, because um, I, I, every time I talk about mercury and I talk about fillings, I'm always worried that someone's gonna, gonna go out and try to get their amalgam fillings removed. If you're gonna do that, make sure you go to a biological dentist. There's a proper procedure. I've actually known people who have been severely damaged from having it done wrong. I've even met a woman who was paralyzed on one side of her body from having her amalgams taken out improperly. There is a way to do it, so don't just run out to your dentist and tell them you need to take it out. Make sure it's done the right way. Um, again, that's the warning that comes on the bottle that uh, has the mercury. Um, you know, and I put up these mercury symptoms here for you to look at. You know, you can Google this stuff. And I, I'm, I don't know, maybe, Paula, we can talk about it at the end. I don't know if this, uh, if we can make all this available. Obviously, the recording will be here so you can come back and watch it. But uh, uh, my information will be at the end. You can even email me. I'll send you this if you want it. But uh, familiarize yourself with the symptoms of mercury. Because if someone comes in and they say, I have tinnitus, after listening to Sean LaFig do this talking, like, oh, my gosh, you've got mercury. Well, maybe they do. Probably, you know, but not absolutely. And so learn, you know, what are their other symptoms? You know, line it all up. If, they, if, if they've got a whole bunch of symptoms of something else and, and not very many symptoms of mercury, well, maybe the tinnitus is caused by some other dysregulation. It could still be toxicity, but maybe not necessarily mercury. So always familiarize yourself with the specific symptoms. I want to touch on lead real quick. Um, you know, where does lead come from? It comes from Flint, Michigan, apparently. Uh, <laughs> uh, Flint, Michigan is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just an introduction to the problem we have in our country with lead in our water, especially in the northeastern part of the United States. There are places that are just as bad, if not worse than this, but they just haven't received the public attention. But I guarantee you, lead is in a lot more places than you would have ever imagine it to be. Flint just kind of opened our eyes to it. And unfortunately, it's been kind of buried. Um, <clears throat> but lead is, lead is literally everywhere. Um, I remember reading an article several years ago that, that said that lead is everywhere in this country in the dirt, in the water, and in the air we breathe. And so unless you can get away from those three things, you're going to be exposed to lead. Um, ladies, if you've ever worn that really gorgeous bright red lipstick and it's not the organic kind, chances are they use lead to make the red pigment for it. And lead is in a lot of, a lot of other products that we that used to, they used to use it, to, I'm sorry, no, mercury was in eye drops. Mercury is still used, I think, in foundation for women, at least it used to. I haven't checked for a while, but your foundation, check it, it might have mercury in it. But lead is, we've, we've, we've gotten lead, uh, I think, in toothpaste, uh, in candy. Uh, it's been in all kinds of things. So lead is just everywhere. Matter of fact, a lot of us grew up in the lead generation. I can remember the smell 
of leaded gasoline when I was a kid. It actually kind of smelled good. It smells very different than than the than unleaded gasoline. But I remember the smell. I always like going to the gas station because I like the smell of the gasoline. And of course, here I am breathing all this lead into my brain, which probably explains a lot of things that happened in my younger years that we won't talk about. <laughs> but you know, we it's it was in our gasoline, it was in our pipes, it was in our paint. Um, I, matter of fact, I, I just talked to a woman a few days ago. I was talking to about this talk that I'm doing, and she goes, "Yeah, I remember when I was pregnant with my daughter, who's now in her 20s. I was scraping paint off of an old house that had lead-based paint on it. Had no idea what she was doing to herself. You know, breathing in all that 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 dust that's just coated with lead. You know, um, and, and and that lead is just going in and it's going straight through the placenta into the baby. The the, the placenta cannot protect against uh, um, heavy metals. As a matter of fact, that's my second point. There is mom is our number one source of lead. Uh, it's the placenta can protect you against viruses, bacteria, fungal, all kinds of amazing things, but it can't protect against heavy metals or chemicals or drugs, even prescription drugs. Uh, you know, it just it doesn't because it's not designed. And there's, you know, we we weren't we don't live in a natural world that, that that has those things naturally in it. You know, so they 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 get through the placenta. Um, in fact, lead has an affinity for bone. Lead is especially difficult for women because when a woman is pregnant, she's going to need more calcium. The, we, we know that the body pulls minerals and calcium from the bone to give the, the mom the calcium she needs so she can nourish the baby. Well, if it's pulling the minerals from the bone, it's pulling the lead out with it and it's depositing that straight into the baby. And so we, we know that the, uh, the estimates that they've said is if we could remove all sources of lead, which isn't going to happen, but if we could get all the environmental exposure out, it would take four generations to remove the lead in our bodies because of how much of it passes from mom to baby. Um, real quick, lead, I'm going to just do on this. I got to keep moving. I'm going to run out of time. Um, we know that for every uh, 17 micrograms of lead in your body, your IQ is reduced by 10 points. And, and I put this up here because I want to make a point so to, to you get this. You know, the question is, you know, well, how much of this does it take for me to have a problem, right? And what is 17 micrograms? And of course, I'm always the, well, I got to figure out the answer to these things. So I, I sat down and I did the math and I took something small and, and I took, a, I found a dime. I said, okay, how much does a dime weigh? You know, it's, it weighs almost nothing. You, you can set it on your leg and not even know it's there. But if you took, and I want to know how many micrograms it weighs, if you took a dime and divided it up into 147,000 equal pieces, one of those pieces would be 17 micrograms. So that's beyond microscopic. That's just a it's, a, it's nothing. There is zero safe levels of mercury, but but lead is, it, it takes such a little amount to cause massive neurological problems that detoxing for heavy metals is one of the best things that you can do for your clients. So obviously the question is, how do we get rid of these metals, right? Well, you want to use yeah. I don't want you to hurry, okay? Don't feel oh. pressured. Oh no, no, I'm not. No, I'm good. I'm good. I, yeah, I think I'm, my time is good. But I, I appreciate the, the support on that because we're, 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 we're close enough here. So thank you. Good. Paul, I you're like right it. at the part we're all waiting for. So we're fine. Right, right. So here's, here's that, the part we're all waiting for, the solution. And I think that that's what people, when they come to your clinic, when they meet with you, whether you're virtual or whatever, when your clients come to you, you they want to know that you have something different i mean if this isn't different than anything you ever heard then i'm just going to hang it up because i've never seen anything even close to this presentation that you just saw today but what they want more to know than you've got that you're different than everybody else is that you actually do have a solution that works and so it's about removing those toxins all the way down to the cell level because that's where the receptors are right we've got to have those receptors operating so some of the things to consider i'm going to talk about stuff that 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 i don't use or maybe some of it I do use or have used. Um, uh, as Dr. Pompa says, you know, 98% uh, of heavy metal detox is not effective and 50% of it's not even safe. And when he says it's not effective, what he's talking about is removing heavy metals down to the cell level. You can remove all the toxins you want from the gut and, and you're never going to fix the problem. And most of these things, when I say on here that they're not true binders, uh, whether it's the chlorella, the heavy metals, you know, detox, people use clay, um, uh, the citrus pectin. They're, they, they're not true binders. First of all, they'll, they'll stick to stuff and bind to stuff in the gut, and they may lose their bond to it and then grab it again. But they'll, they'll definitely help pull stuff from the gut, but they're not going to get into the cell, and they're certainly not going to get into the blood-brain barrier. Um, glutathione 
is, is does not uh, pull heavy metals. A lot of people use glutathione, and, and the problem with glutathione, taking it orally is 98% of it is destroyed in the gut. You can compound it into like a cream at a compounding pharmacy, and you'll absorb, I think, maybe a little over 10% of it by rubbing it on your skin. But what you really need is glutathione produced at the cell level. Uh, glutathione is the best antioxidant on the face of the planet. It's far more powerful than vitamin C and anything else you can think of. You know, it's, it is the greatest antioxidant, and it's involved with all detox processes. A person who, who depletes their glutathione stores is going to become trashed because they all of a sudden lose the ability to detox. So you need three amino acids, glycine, glutamine, and N-acetylcysteine, and you need to support those things in the body, getting into the cell, producing glutathione at the cell level so that it can push those toxins out. It can detox all the way into the cell. Um, another one is zeolites. A lot of, I know a lot of people who use zeolites. Uh, the problem with zeolites is some of them can't even cross through the gut. The ones that can cross through the gut can't get into the cell. They can't get into the blood-brain barrier. There's only one zeolite out there, and I'm actually going to talk about it. Paul really wanted me to talk about this one. Um, the zeolites, are, they, they're great binders. I mean, they bind to stuff really well. We use them in industrial waste cleanups and, you know, like for big spills and stuff like that. But, uh, but using a, a powdered or even a liquid zeolite um, it just doesn't work in the human body. It'll, like I said, it'll pull stuff out of the gut all day long, and that's great. But what you need to do is get to the cell and eventually get into the brain, your hypothalamus and your pituitary are your control towers. Cilantro, I love cilantro in my salsa, and that's about it. I like it on some other foods too, my burritos or whatever else, but I don't like it as a chelator. And the reason why is it actually is a fairly decent chelator uh, of heavy metals, but the problem is, is it's very inconsistent. It can grab stuff and stir stuff up. It can deposit stuff in your brain. It can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. You can actually take a person who is very heavy metals toxic, give them uh, cilantro as a key later, and you'll give them what we call the crazies. They just they lose their mind because now you've just stirred up so many heavy metals. So uh, I just think cilantro, even though it will long run pull metals out, it, it's just not safe. Um, the only time I've ever heard of anybody ever dying from doing heavy metals detox was when they were doing intravenous DMPS treatments. Um, they're just not safe, you know, and I, I just don't, I, they work, but there's a risk involved that the DMPS and the EDTA uh, done intravenously. Oral DMSA is what I used for years, and it works. Uh, the problem is, uh, the biggest problem is patient compliance or client compliance. You know, they, you had to take DMSA every four hours. That means getting up in the middle of the night to take one at two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And you had to do this for several days in a row and you had to cycle it on and off. And, and that was problematic for a lot of people. If it, some, some people just because the patient compliance was so hard to, to keep that they would just tell me, you know, take 500 milligrams three times a day. I've worked with doctors who I love and respect that do that. The problem is when you take a large amount of DMSA, it stirs up all these metals. And if you don't keep taking it every few hours afterwards, all those metals resettle and then you become exacerbated in symptoms. And I know even for me doing it this way, the way I did it, when I was chelating for heavy metals with DMSA, I became very symptomatic. And a lot of people do. I, the, I don't with the new product that I use now, but oral DMSA, plus you can't get oral DMSA anyway. I just wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, we've used it, we used it very successfully, but it was just a really hard product to use, it was, but it was the only effective things we had available to us. Now you can only get it through a prescription. So, those are the ones that I'm not crazy about. What does work? I'm just going to go ahead and show you, though. There's, there's a lot of good protocols, a lot of good programs out there. There really are. And, and the one that I use is not the only one. Um, it's the one that I like best. You know, maybe part of that is just because I've been doing it so long that I understand it really well, and I know how to make it work for everybody that walks through my door. Uh, so I've been using this for a long time. And uh, the we I've used several companies. One that I like the most is Systemic Formulas. And, and I would guess most of you may have never even heard of Systemic Formulas. I, I call them the best kept secrets. Um, I, one of the things I love about Systemic Formulas is they actually have a passion about this detoxification at the cell level. Um, it was something that they jumped on board and they said, you know, we need to make products that, that lend themselves to people being able to detox. They have a, a wide range of products. And you, if you get a person who has adrenal fatigue and doesn't have heavy metals, guarantee you Systemic Formulas will have the products. They even have one called GA. It's specific for your adrenal glands. Um, but these two products here, G-Cell and Bind, uh, G-Cell is 
addresses that issue that I talked about, about the intracellular glutathione. It, it has the products that you need to drive that in there to support your detox pathways at a, at a, at a milder level, but increasing your glutathione so that now your body can grow it grow or, 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 or develop its own glutathione in the cell. It has the tools that it needs to do that. And this product is, is awesome. I, this is actually the third generation is the one that they have now. It's been, it's been worked on for several years and this is the, the, the newest and, and best version so far. Um, the other one next to it is called bind and it does exactly what it says it does. It binds to things. It is an activated carbon or as some people call it a charcoal, um, but it's also blended with some, some herbs that are known to be good binders as well. So it makes it a more broad spectrum uh, binding agent. It'll pull everything, uh, heavy metals. When they're in your gut, it'll grab them. It'll grab biotoxins. It'll grab uh, pesticides, everything. It's a great binding agent. So the G cell allows you to, build the glutathione to start detoxing. And then you take the bind, you take that at nighttime. Uh, for those who don't know how the liver functions at night, every night, somewhere in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning, whatever it is, your liver dumps and it gets rid of, that's why people who drink, for instance, you go out drinking, you wake up at like three o'clock in the morning and you're wide awake. It's because your liver just dumped all that excess sugar into your stomach and, or into your, into your uh, gut. And, and now you've just got a sugar rush in the middle of the night. So if you haven't consumed a bunch of sugary stuff before bed, you'll do the toxic dump, not wake up. But now you've got all these toxins in your gut and Bind will help get those out of there for you. Um, so I love those two products. Um, downstream detox pathways, the kidney, kidneys, I should say, the liver and your gut, those need to be addressed before anything else. Um, you, you just, you have to address those. You try to de detox too fast. Uh, you can make a person sick. They'll feel horrible. You may not do any permanent damage, but you can make them feel worse uh, in, uh, if, you, if you try to jump ahead of, of the game. So always uh, support the, the downstream detox pathways. So the kidneys, we know, are crucial. Um, Doc Wheelwright, oh, that's what I was talking about. I was going to talk about Doc Wheelwright. He's the founder of Systemic Formulas. Um, he obviously is, uh, the guy was a genius. He's obviously not real clever when it comes to coming up with names for his products, but um, he spent years traveling the world. He would go to these remote areas, uh, go to these villages. He would ask the local healers, you know, what do you do when someone gets sick? And they would show him the herbs or the roots or the tree bark or whatever. And he would compile all this and, and he figured out how to blend these herbs together. So this one here specifically, K-Kidney, uh, we know that everything in the universe vibrates at its own unique frequency, including a, a healthy functioning kidney has a specific frequency at which it vibrates. Well, he blended the herbs to match that frequency so that now it's a targeted herbal blend that goes straight for helping heal that kidney and getting that kidney functioning the way it should. Um, of course, L for liver, that's going to be directed straight at the liver to help bring out a healthy liver function. These two products alone I, I will, some people, you just give them this, it'll turn their life around because their kidneys and their, their, their liver are so trashed. But Doc Wheelwright developed all these amazing protocols, all these amazing herbal blends. And the, the magic behind it isn't the individual ingredients. It's, it's the synergy with which all, all these herbs work together. You know, a lot of people want to talk about milk thistle this or, you know, CoQ10 or whatever it is that they got. But it's with, with, with systemic formulas, the, the synergy behind the blend is what makes it so amazing. And Doc Wilwright, this, these were his first two um, retail, well not retail, wholesale products that he sold to practitioners with the kidney and the liver formulas. And he has since developed a whole lot more. Uh, they have a wide range. Um, his son runs the company now and his grandson is getting ready to take over. Uh, but this other one here, NBC, uh, as it says, 100 billion probiotic. Well, they, the thing I love about systemic formulas is the quality control. So they took the NBC, they shipped it all over the country in freezing temperatures, in hot temperatures, put it on a shelf for a couple months, and just let it sit, and then they'd open it up and test it. And they said that we can say safely 100% of the time that there's at least 100 billion probiotics, but some of them are coming back closer to like even numbers up closer to even a trillion. Um, so they, they test everything. Matter of fact, they blend their own herbs, so they order the raw material in every single batch that comes to them is tested for molds, mycotoxins, parasites, pesticides, heavy metals, you name it. It's the purest, most amazing products that I've ever used and I've had incredible results. So always, always address downstream detox pathways before you start detoxing someone. Um, 
through just years and years of, of doing this, of, of putting this together, uh, they finally came up with this kind of a system. It's everything's in a box. The pills are in little blister packets. It makes it easy for patient compliance. It's it's what works for 98% of the people. Um, so they, they've done, like I said, you've got to prepare the body. The prep phase has that kidney, that liver, that MBC, a couple other things in it as well. It's going to prepare your body for detox, okay? Then the next thing you want to do is you want to go into the body and start cleaning the body out. You want to, you don't want to go to the brain first because you, like I said, you give someone the crazy. So what we do is we create a concentration gradient. We remove toxins from the body, and someone might need one or two of these body phases. You know, some people might just be able to prep the body and then straight into brain, and then do several brain phases. But some people might need a couple of prep or two or three body phases. But you want to make sure that the body is cleansed enough that when you do go into the brain, when we start moving metals, they move from the brain to the body instead of vice versa. So you've got a, a, a 30 day box that prepares the body, a body phase that cleans the body out, and then the, the brain phase is very similar to the body phase, except that it incorporates alpha lipoic acid into it. But the one thing that, uh, that you are absolutely going to need for pulling heavy metals is, is a true binder, a good chelator. And this product, Cytodetox, you use in conjunction with the body phase and the brain phase, but not with the prep phase. In fact, I'm gonna, I'll tell you about a practitioner who did that, and it's kind of funny that uh, what she did to herself in light of our conversation here, our, our, our webinar. Uh, so Cytodetox is a clinoptilolite. It is a, a hydrolyzed form of a zeolite. It's patented. Uh, it, was a, it was developed by uh, Nick Syracos. He's a Greek cardiologist, world-renowned cardiologist, and he developed a system to take the, the, the zeolite get it small enough and light enough that it can not only get into the cell, but it can cross into the blood brain barrier. And because of the way it's structured, the way you have to pull the existing, it's actually made from lava rock. Um, it, the way you have to pull the existing metals that are bound to it out, it leaves these gaps, these openings that are looking for heavy metals to bind to and remove them. It's, a, it's an amazing system. So in every case- You want case, to show that slide, Sean? What's, what slide? You want to show the Cyto Detox slide? Is it not up? Nope. Do you see the true cellular detox? I see in every case. Oh, really? I have cytodetox up right now is what I'm showing. And okay. I've had it up. I I've had, is it showing I, I apologize. Now? Okay. All right. You had me worried. Yeah, because I had the cytodetox up the whole time I was talking about it. So it's just a little bottle. It comes in drops. It's really easy. It has a very mild flavor to it. It's not offensive in any way. Um, but this product, I love it because when I use it, I don't get symptomatic like I did when I used to use DMSA. Um, but in every case, you know, always work with a professional who understands, you know, if this is something new to you, you know, reach out to me. I'll help you through the process. Um, you know, you've got to understand how to support these detox pathways and, and do it right because your chances are slim. You're going to do any real damage to someone, but you're going to make them feel so horrible that they're not going to want to work with you again. You know, it's, 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 you know, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, this practitioner that I was just talking about, uh, she came to me, she said, I'm not sure what's going on, but. Um, she said, I started cyto de or started the, the true cellular detox program and um, uh, my ears haven't stopped ringing for over three weeks now. But I thought it was funny that she gave herself tinnitus and here I am talking about tinnitus. Um, I said, well, what phase are you? And she goes, well, I just started the prep phase and the cyto detox. I said, well, there's your problem. You started trying to pull heavy metals. I said, who told you to do that? And she's like, I don't know. I just had the products and I started taking them. So it's, it's good to educate yourself. You know, she didn't educate herself. So now she's got to listen to her ears ring for a while. And I told her it's not the end of the world that as she detoxes properly, eventually that'll fix itself and the tinnitus will go away. But I actually had a, uh, uh, a gal call me. Actually, her husband called me because she couldn't talk to me. Um, she did someone else's program and it's a program that's a good heavy metals detox program. There's nothing wrong with it, but you need to do any good program with a health coach or, you know, a, a, a practitioner who knows the ins and outs of how to adjust according. Every single person is different. Um, she was working with a practitioner and decided she didn't want to pay his fees anymore. She was going to do it on her own and she ordered the products online and kept taking it. And the first thing that happened to her was she woke up one day and she couldn't walk. And then a few weeks later, she couldn't talk. Her words were totally slurred. She tried to talk to me, and I couldn't understand a word she said. This is just because she was trying to detox from heavy metals, and she was trying to be a Lone Ranger and do it on her own. So, you know, it's it's something to drive home to people that it, it may seem like, you know, it's a pretty simple process, but you can really do some damage to yourself. This woman, I, I'm assuming there will be a way for her to recover. Um, she reached out to me, and I was like, you know, this this is, this is way beyond your basic protocol now. You have a lot of work to do. And, you know, they just, 
there's something they weren't, I don't know. I don't, I, I, she hasn't called me back, so I don't know what's going on with it. But anyway, point is you can damage a person, so make sure that you know what you're doing uh, before you implement these programs. Uh, definitely talk to an expert and get well-educated in it. And with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. I guess, James, you have the, the questions for me? I do. Um, oh, Paul, John, thank you. Okay. Absolutely. I'm back. And um, thank okay. you very much. It was a, quite a comprehensive presentation here, and we have a number of questions. So I'm going to get right to it. Um, I really appreciate your, your perspective, though, and your emphasis on, on the downstream pathways for detoxification and just how important it is to address those first and, and make sure they're functional and flowing because it's one thing to mobilize heavy metals out of the cells and tissues. It's quite another of them to have them in circulation and circulation and circulation and circulation without clearing the body. It's chaos. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yeah, it is chaos. It'll make it can make you go crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and the emphasis on lead. I wanted to come back to that just for a minute. Um, uh, I appreciate bringing that one in there too. Yeah, lead comes from Flint, Michigan. We all don't know that now. But the um, one of the new toys, the, the new rage that's that's out on on the thing are these things spinners. called fidget. Spinners. Fidget spinners. Fidget, yep. fidget spinners, right? Yep. And yep. Um, everybody seems to have one in their hands or, or multiples of them. But the point I want to make here is there's a concern about lead paint coming out of China on yep. the metal. Not the plastic spinners because though that's embedded paint that can't chip off, but the metal paint can chip off. Um, it's not all um, lead-based out of China, but you need to discern that. So yeah, I, I I read an article about that as well. How they're they're saying that a lot of these spinners that are coming in, especially from China, are they contain lead in them? Something to be concerned about. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, like I said, it's everywhere. It's just it's it's everywhere. You know, we just don't realize how much we're exposed to this stuff on a daily basis. Yeah, and and that point about um, our moms being the number one source of lead, and and we need to get rid of all the lead. We don't want to get rid of our moms, though. Well, no, we can do, we can do, so we can we talk to our moms before they become moms. I actually have a whole program that it's it's a hard sell because you know young young women you know they 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 either can't afford it or they don't see the need for it. Yeah. Um, you know, they think everything is going to be fine, but you know, we have these this massive problem, and I, yeah. I believe that you know this this problem with autism, you know, whether it's triggered by the MMR vaccine or you know whatever whatever the the ultimate hay or the ultimate straw is on the camel's back, um, I believe that uh, you know the heavy metals that mom passes on to the baby are a big part of why we're seeing young children with so many chronic diseases. It's just I mean, kids. I knew one kid growing up who had asthma. One. That was it, man. A third of the kids out there now right. seem to have asthma, and I, and I believe that, it, that it's toxicity that mom passes along, and it's not her fault. You know, it's not something that she can control. But if we could, you know, get these women cleansed, you know, even put them through a six-month just a body cleanse alone, at least they're gonna, you know, I, I think it's a big part of, of you know. You look at thyroid, the HPA axis affects the thyroid. Heavy metals affect the thyroid. We know that hypothyroidism is strongly connected with miscarriages. And there's a lot of things. Yeah, so detoxing a mom before she gets pregnant, if I could do that, oh, my gosh, that would be, yes. that would, that would be the happiest thing. Uh, really, it's really, it's really, you know, family planning, I think, is so, is so important in this regard, is to be able to give um, not just the mother but the, the farmer, the, 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 um, the donor, the sperm donor, the father, um, uh, they need to clean it up too because they've got a one-shot deal there and yep. you want to have it be a, the best shot that they can give, the cleanest shot. So, yep. All right. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize that this is being recorded. It'll be posted to our website in a few days. So the audio is recorded and the PowerPoint will be up there too. So all the slides will be available for you to review and to download should you want access to them after the pass. So don't worry. There's a lot of information here and some great, um, the, some just some great slides in terms of the physiology and anatomy and things. So thank you. Um, in terms of tinnitus, do you think it can also be related? You, you named a number of conditions, but the, the this person has somebody that gets um, Bell's palsy repeatedly. Hmm. Well, I, absolutely, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would uh, put a connection there. Well, for sure. Yeah. Again, you know, you're talking. You're talking. Uh, you know, it's an inflammatory response. So, yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things that you you brought up just briefly 
was testing, but we didn't get into it too much. But here, we don't want to just assume that somebody's metal toxic. I mean, we could assume that we all are, but we really don't want to. So it, do you do certain testing um, before you work with somebody, during and after? What, what's your process with tests? I, I, the one test that I always give everybody is not really a test, but it's a, it's a questionnaire. That's my favorite tool to use is a questionnaire uh, for a lot of reasons. One is it is when people come to you, you know, you, we, we live with these little aches and pains and a little bit of brain fog or whatever it is that we've got in our life. And we learn to just kind of push it to the back of our mind. And uh, um, when you've got to sit down with a questionnaire and rate all of your symptoms on a, on a scale, it brings it to the front of your mind. I've had people go, I hate this questionnaire because it reminds me how sick I really am. Mm -hmm. But people kind of need to be reminded of that. But it's also a great tool to track their progress. You know, I have people take a questionnaire usually at least every three months. And, you know, they come to me and they go, I'm not sure this is working right. I'll do another questionnaire just to show them look how much better you're getting. You know, maybe little changes in, in a whole bunch of areas, not one great big change, but yeah. you're better. And so I, that's the one thing that I always use as a questionnaire, and I love it. Um, there's a fantastic, if you want to test for and there's, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of great labs out there that you can do for all kinds of things. But if you want to test for heavy metals, uh, Doctors Data has a really good heavy metals test that I, I've, been use, I've been using for years. Yes. Um, Genova also, doctor's data, I agree, um, top of the line gets my vote for, um, for metals testing. Um, Dr. David Quigg with, with doctor data is, is just fantastic and I've done some just brilliant interviews with him and, and his work around heavy metals and, and their testing um, platform is, is unparalleled in my experience. And yep, it's something that, that I've done, um, you know, a questionnaire, absolutely, it, it's, it's the first one, it's what, you know, the, the, the intake from a client is going to reveal questionnaire is going to take it to the next level. If there's a question after that, I lead with um, with a with a doctor's data test, and um, depending on the finances of the person and the severity of, of the situation, um, a questionnaire may be adequate for progressing through yeah. a protocol. But it's something that I might do at the midway point and certainly at, um, after the fact. Yeah, I, you, and many, a, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you brought up a good point is some people, they want the tests and they'll pay for it. And, and they like, I want to see, I want to see what my heavy metals are. I want to see what my hormone levels are. You know, they might want to test for, you know, and you can like, you can test for MSH like that one that I was talking about to see, you know, are you utilizing leptin? You can test for leptin levels. You know, there's a lot of things. Some people want to see those, but some people, they go, no, I don't need to see it. I know I feel bad. I know there's something wrong with me. And if you say that this is what I need, then let's do it and they don't want to spend the money on it, and so they're happy. So it's it's definitely different for every person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you were going to say, do I have something? Um, and, and do you have an opinion on um, hair analysis for metals? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> when it comes to uh, testing for heavy metals, the thing that we have to understand is we have a gene type. Uh, all of us do. It's the APOE gene type. It stands for apolipo protein and then you put the letter e at the end of it apolipoprotein e um, and you're either a two a three or a four there's extremely rare cases that people are a one but you're either a two a three or a four uh, people who are apoe2 they they genetically detox pretty well for heavy metals all right a person who's apoe3 they'll detox but not as well as the apoe2 and a person who's apoe4 gene type uh, they just don't detox for, for heavy metals very well naturally on their own. They bind up heavy metals and they hold on to it. And so if I gave you a hair analysis and, you know, we take a clip of hair, we send it in and they test it and they say, oh, gosh, look, you're loaded with all these metals. Look at all these metals that are in your hair. Well, that could be a person who's APOE2 and they're just naturally detoxing for metals and they really don't have much of a body burden. It's not really a big problem for them, right? But if a person's APOE4, and they're not naturally excreting. You could take their hair and, and you test it and go, you know what? You don't really have a heavy metals problem. Well, they do have a heavy metals. They have a massive problem because it's bound up. They can't even get it out. So it's not even going to be in their hair except maybe in minuscule amounts. So you'll run a test and you'll go, you know, it's, you're actually going to get the exact opposite results. It, it would help if you knew the person's gen, uh, gene type. You know, that would that would make a difference. Um, but the reason and, and when I do the, the doctor's data test, uh, unfortunately, the, the best way to do that test, and now I have to work with a practitioner who can help me with this, um, is uh, is you want to use DMSA. Uh, we've used DMSA for years, and what DMSA does, again, if I, if I give a urine test to someone who's an APOE2, 
they're going to show more metals than a person who's an APOE4 if I just do straight urine. Uh, but if you add DMSA to go in and pull the metals out, it levels the genetic playing field. So it doesn't matter if you're a two or three or a four, you, you know, your body burden results will be, will show up the same on the test results, regardless of your, your genetic makeup. So, and, and blood tests, uh, since we're on the, the subject of that, of the different types of tests, uh, blood tests are only accurate for acute exposure. Blood is not a storage container. It's a transportation agent. And so it'll hold on to metals for a few days or even a few weeks, but usually 30 days, it's completely gone and it's been absorbed into the soft tissue. So, you know, people, people all the time go, well, I got a blood test for, for heavy metals. And they said, I didn't have any heavy metals. So, yeah, because you haven't been, you know, if you, if I went and got my, my fillings drilled out and I breathed a bunch of stuff in, and then five days later, I got a test. I'd probably show up as positive for, for mercury. But unless you're being actively exposed to it, it's not going to show up in blood. So, you know, I, I prefer to do the, the provoked DSA challenged uh, test from doctor's data. That to me is the only one that truly will give you the right picture. Okie doke. Thank you. A um, lot of questions here. So I, I want to take care of this one right away because we scared people about the dishwasher off-gassing is it really the dishwasher that off-gassing or is it the stuff that you put in your dishwasher to wash the dishes that off yeah it's it's, it's it's the detergent that you use obviously you know you can get clean detergents you know you can get a, a a good you know organic i mean a lot of times i'll just use vinegar to be honest with you it works great it's just the, the problem with the, the biggest problem with with the more organic cleaners is you know they, they they don't you know you still get more spots it's hard to, to get the spots off so you might have to rub it with a towel unless you, you, root, unless you use but, that special rinse formula um and then that's another whole matter but you know let's right yeah spots versus okay so that's not a problem but, but yeah but, it's, it's not but, the dishwasher itself it's what we put in the dishwasher yes but maybe it could be the dishwasher if the dishwasher is brand new and you run it and all that hot water into the plastic parts you know yeah so sure. maybe, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. If, it's, if it's made of plastic it's going to off gas yeah. and plus if you're if you don't have a filter in your house there's going to be chlorine and possibly fluoride and who knows what else in the water as well depending so on what water we got running through but no karen asks a, an interesting question it's like the dishwasher off gases does it stick to our dishes um yeah. i mean it's an interesting question right if something off gases where does it go <laughs> onto yeah. our dishes exactly there you go, Karen. Um, so here, here's a comment here from Libby, who's working with several clients with multiple sclerosis who have horrible tinnitus, and yep. all of them have mercury fillings, and all of them are under considerable pressure and depression. It's a vicious cycle, she says. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it is a vicious cycle, and 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 unless those MS patients get those amalgam fillings removed yes. and go through a heavy metals detox program, yes. they are they're going to just continue to decline. There's, there's, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, that's mercury will eat away at the myelin sheath. And that's exactly what MS is, is it's, it's a demyelination of, of the sheath around your nerves and it creates these scars. And and I, one of my, one of my mentors, my college professors, I watched him in the four years that I was going to college decline. I didn't know any of this stuff at the time, but I uh, wish I could go back in time and, and, you know, <laughs> 30 years ago and, and show him how to, prevent all that from happening to them but okay. yeah ms is just ms is just a terrible but yeah i would expect a person with advanced ms to have uh, chronic tinnitus absolutely so you know a follow-up comment from libby on this is that she had her amalgams removed years ago and had a dentist who had to leave two of them because he said removing them would cause more issues so he left them alone uh yeah you know it's some of the the, the problem with amalgam fillings is they have to cut away so much of the tooth in order to put the amalgam in, um, and so what happens is when you when you take them out, uh, you may have to remove even more of the tooth, and, and now you've either got a tooth that's completely unstable or that needs to be extracted. Um, if I had to choose between leaving an amalgam filling in my, my mouth and having my tooth extracted and replaced with an implant, I would have it extracted, mm -hmm. so the implant. Okay. The, you, titanium is is for the most part inert. Some people say there are issues with it. Um, I don't have a problem with it, but they do make zirconian ones now that are less toxic. But from what I understand, the nice thing about titanium is that it, it is more reactive. And so the bone wants to actually grow around it and bind to it. And you actually have to put a, a, a stimulating agent. It's, it's actually a titanium agent, of all things, in, uh, in the, the, 
the implant or around the base of the implant so that the bone will actually adhere to the zirconian. But uh, but yeah, I, if, I, if I had amalgam fillings, I would, even if I had to lose the entire tooth, I would rather get rid of the amalgam filling. Okay. And that's how much, that's, that's how much I'm convinced that it's that dangerous for you. Okay. All right. Thanks for that opinion. Um, can you explain why would ringing be louder on one side over the other? Wouldn't the ringing be equal if it's cellular issue? Uh, yeah, you would think that it would be symmetrical, but uh, you know, it's again, you know, maybe maybe there was uh, um, you know some damage. Like I used to fly for the Air Force. I refit airplanes in flight for 14 years, and uh, I was uh, I was active duty for four, and I was reservist for 10, and I got 3,500 hours flying in the in this airplane that's quite loud and when we want to talk to each other not using the intercom we would pull one of the ear cups and i always had the microphone on my right side so i'd always pull the ear cup back on my left side and yeah. so i've got i've got hearing loss in my left ear from doing that and so you know that would affect for me i'm sure would have an effect on how i would hear uh, the ringing because that maybe there's more damage in one area so you may have you know uh, something else that's creating an inflammatory response and a stimulation it could be you know more than just the you know, the heavy metals or the mineralocorticoids or whatever it could be some other physical you know or, or maybe heavy metals just ended up settling in the left side more than the right side or the right side more than the left side so it could be it could be a variety of things but i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it, it, it logic would seem that it would be um uh, uh symmetrical but that's the reason why it would have and, and i could say it, it, it's it's not uncommon um and as crazy as chronic tinnitus is when it's different in one ear than the other, it's even crazier. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Do you think that there's a connection with tinnitus and fatty acid balance and cholesterol levels? Tinnitus, fatty acid balance, and cholesterol? Mm -hmm. um, I would say so because, like I said, you know, all of our um, all of our cells are made up of saturated fats and cholesterol. Our brain is, you know, so. So yeah, like you know, like I was alluding to before, you put a person on uh, you know statins, and you're trying to reduce their cholesterol level. You know, you're you're messing with nerve production, and you're messing with brain function, and and everything. So you know your your lipid bilayer. So yeah, cholesterol levels and cholesterol. The thing to remember about cholesterol is, you know, there's 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 the the total count of cholesterol. There's the there's the uh, um, LDL and HDL. But then within the uh, LDL, there's a, there's a particle size. And what really matters, there's the number of particles, and then there's the particle size. There's the small particles and the big particles. And that ratio is actually more important than the LDL to HDL ratio. And we don't have time to go into that right now. But the point is um, cholesterol is an anti-inflammatory. It's a great anti-inflammatory. So if your cholesterol is elevated, chances are you're dealing with an inflammatory issue going on that your body's trying to suppress that inflammation by producing more cholesterol. And so if that inflammation is never addressed, then of course, yeah, can it lead to tinnitus? Absolutely it can, because that's just another bundle of nerves to get inflamed. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um. Hmm. Sorry, uh, so I'm going to this one. Um, gadolinium. I'm sorry, Margo. I don't know gadolinium. Um, do you have? A, do you understand if there's a gadolinium and cadmium chelating? Yeah, yeah. So the the yeah right. the uh, so like you as you know the doctor's data test uh, yes. checks for 17 different metals, a whole bunch of them, and okay, uh, in, 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 including uranium. And so if, if you're able to pull those out, you can chelate them. So yeah, the, the, this, this, uh, this cytodetox, the DMSA was the same way, but this cytodetox will pull pretty much any heavy metal in your body. Matter of fact, it, it pulls minerals too. So you actually, while you're doing this, you have to, on your off cycle, because you cycle the cytodetox, you don't do it continuously. You cycle it on and off, week on, week off. So in your off week, you take a mineral supplement to replace the minerals that this pulls. So yeah, it'll pull all of those heavy metals. I mean, I, even uranium. You know, I, it's funny, you know, having my clinic in Kansas, um, I never saw uranium in a person's body. And out of all the tests that I ran from doctor's data, get out to California and I saw it in several people, they have uranium. I mean, to the point where it's not just like a trace amount, it's, it's significant amounts. We had a, a woman who had so much uranium, it was, you could, it was coming out of her skin. She had lesions all over her skin. Um, yeah, California is a very toxic place. So yeah, it's, it's to answer the question, absolutely, this chelator will pull all heavy metals. Okay. 
So we're at 520 now. I want to give us, there, there's a lot of questions left and, and um, people are, are staying. So I'm going to give yeah, us 10 more minutes. Absolutely. And, and for those who are staying, first of all, I really appreciate you staying. And second, if we don't get to your question or if you think of a question later on, um, can you see my screen right now? It has my, my name and contact. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's just it's just geared for wellness at Gmail. That's the easiest one to get a hold of me and and feel free to email me any questions you have and I'm I'm genuinely happy to help this. So do you test your clients for um, the MTHFR gene? We recently learned that if you have a mutation either one or two, that your body stores eighty to nine percent of mercury. So if someone has a mutation, can they still detox mercury? Yeah, yeah, they can. I, I haven't actually started testing for that. Uh, I'm actually going to, I just ordered the test for myself because I, whenever I do something, I always do it to myself first. So I actually just ordered the test for myself just because I want to, I want to see what, what, uh, you know, what, what, if I've got one of the variants in there. Um, but, but even if you have the MTHFR gene, you still, or the factor or whatever it's called, you can, you can still detox for heavy metals. Uh, that's fine. Again, it, it goes back to a person who's APOE4. Um, you know, they don't detox well for metals, but when you put a chelator, the chelator doesn't care what your genetic makeup is. It doesn't care about your genome. It doesn't care about your MTHFR. It's going to go in and grab it. But the cool thing is, you know, and one of the products is actually in True Cellular Detox, and it's a product that I use with, with pretty much everybody, no matter what program they're on. It's a product that Systemic makes called Moors, and it actually has an active form of, of methylator in it. And, and so you actually, the, that, that, those, those uh, methyl binding, those methyl agents, um, they actually address that MTHFR uh, uh, makeup. So yeah, you can, you can even address that with, uh, with methylation. You just use a good methylator and you're, you're going to be fine. But yeah, but as far as chelating for head metals, the chelator doesn't care about your gene makeup. It's going to do its job anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Just to follow up on that, um, gadolinium. Margot says she understood that it can only be pulled out with EDTA and um, comes from an MRI contrast is how we get it. Interesting. I'd have to, I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to find out yeah, about that's that. That's new to me too, Margot. Because I, 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 I use the EDTA um, a, a lot and I like EDTA. We actually use the EDTA suppositories. The thing I liked about it was you only had to do it every eight hours. I like DMSA better, but we would, we would, do DMSA during the day and then at bedtime use an EDTA suppository so you don't have to wait to take more DMSA. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, EDTA is, is great. Um, but as far as the gadolinium, I'll, I'll find out about that. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to uh, Dr. Pompa or Dr. Syracos and, and ask them if they know or are aware of what can pull that specific metal. So in fact, if you would, if you wouldn't mind, um, who was it that asked the question? Yeah. Margo. Margo, Margo, if you would email me with that question, so I'll, it'll remind me to, to 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 the folks over at Cyto Detox. Great, thank you. So I want to go back into the brain phase supplements a little bit and the alpha lipoic acid because there's a number of people that are doing various detoxes, and um, in, in in your brain phase supplements um, that you're detailing here, um, it's only used three times a day. And there are some claims that um, the half-life of alpha lipoic acid is around three to four hours, and that it has to be taken according to that. Um, uh, yeah, and that's when we when we when we did DMSA because the DMSA also had a half-life that was very similar to alpha lipoic acid. We would take DMSA and ALA together, and so you would do it every three to four hours, depending on some people could do four hours, some people needed to do every three hours. You know, we would have to kind of modify it for everyone. Uh -huh. But when you do alpha lipoic acids, actually the way we do is we actually only do it twice a day now. We do it with the cyto detox. And the reason why we can get away with doing it just twice a day or three times a day if you want to um, is that the cyto detox has a much longer half-life. And so it's going to stick around. So anything that the alpha lipoic acid drops, the cyto detox will grab for you. Yeah, so it's a, the, the cyto detox is kind of a carrier, and it, it allows us to get away with not using the alpha lipoic acid every every three or four hours. And did I understand that there was something unique about the uh, uh, the form of alpha lipoic acid that's being used here? Um, I don't know that this one is specifically anything unique about the one that the systemic formulas uses with this okay. with this. Yeah, no, it's it's just okay. like I think it's just like it's a normal alpha lipoic acid. The thing with alpha 
glycolic acid is just to remember is I don't like using it alone uh, for that very reason, the half-life of it. If you, yeah. there, I know people who use alpha glycolic acid as a detoxer, but they yeah. don't use it every three or four hours. And man, you can make a person, if you give someone alpha glycolic acid who's not ready for it, you, they'll, they'll go crazy. So uh, it needs to, that's why I really like using it in conjunction with the cyto detox. Yeah, I, I appreciate really low dose use with um, ALA yes. also for, for that yeah. reason. And, Absolutely. and it's, hard to, it's hard to find it in really low dose. I mean, it's, it's, most supplements have it in very high dose. So you're challenged to find it. Um, what about your experience with um, clients' mercury problems who are also exposed to EMFs or Wi-Fis? Do you see any connection or complication with that? Well, yeah, it's going to compound it. I mean, that's, it's, you know, it's, I don't know that the EMFs are going to be, you know, absorbed by the, the, uh, the mercury, but it's just that we know that EMFs cause damage, they cause cellular damage, you know, they cause inflammation. And so it's just going to be compounded, mm -hmm. but there's no, I've not seen it. And if there, maybe there might be studies that have shown it. I just haven't read them, but I've, um, I've not seen anything that directly is heavy metals with EMF uh, problems. I just know that EMFs in general, you know, it's like, I, I, talk to my cell phone i always use an earpiece and it's not bluetooth it's just the one that plugs in because i i hate having my phone somewhere if i'm out at a restaurant if i have my phone with me i set it down on the table not because i want to check it but because i don't want it in my pocket you know i don't want to to my body so so yeah there it's just going to compound it's that's like anything else you know when you when you get multiple toxins in your body they just work synergistically you know like say for instance glyphosate glyphosate is like an usher you know, it just it just opens the doors for for heavy metals to get in through the gut, get in through the blood brain barrier. Glyphosate is horrible. It it it, it is extremely compounding as far as the effects that mercury and lead have when you're when you're also toxic with glyphosate. So yeah, the EMFs are going to work uh, synergistically as well and create more problems. Okay, well, we need some studies. <laughs> we need some studies on it. Okay, what about, um, it was a comment by Nisha. Thank you so much for this. So I grew up in the 70s with lead generation and, and <laughs> chewing the lead paint off my parents' windowsills. Yes, I was that kid. Yeah, I was that and, kid too. <laughs> um, she had all her um, heavy metals tested a few years ago, specifically lead, and it was zero. She was shocked and wondering what your thoughts are about the body chelating that much exposure naturally. Yeah, you know what? You may be, um, and, you know, again, it depends on the test. Was it was it a urine test, and was it uh, provoked with any type of like the, did they use DMSA or was it just straight yeah. urine? Yeah. So that's going to be part of the it question. It was a blood test. It was a it blood was test. A, oh, okay. Oh yeah, blood test. Like I said before, blood test is not accurate. It's only going to tell yeah. you acute exposure. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the problem. Is you yeah. if you want to know if you have an actual body burden that's chronic long term, I was pretty shocked when you said it was zero. I expected you to say it was low because I've yeah. never tested anybody who had a zero level. Yeah. But you you want to do a provoked urine challenge that, that uses DMSA. Okay. That DMSA is going to go in and it's going to pull out. But yeah, blood tests blood tests are not accurate at all. After 30 days of exposure, that it won't show up in your blood. Yeah. Sorry, Nisha. Um, do you, when you use your questionnaire, Sean, do you use it to determine how long a client should be on the protocol? Some longer than others, or do you going with their ongoing? Um, how they progress and what their symptoms are after that. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you look at it and let's say, you know, I have a questionnaire and you rate all these symptoms and then we add up the numbers and, you know, you want to see what your score is. And if they have a, just a really, you know, through the roof high score, I mean, you know, I'm going to tell them, look, you know, this is, this is a long-term deal. This is, we're not going to fix you in two or three months. You know, you're in for this, it's probably going to be six months or a year or, or more. But, you know, so that, it kind of, it sets the, the, the base, the foundation. And so we use that to let the person, hey, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a long journey here and just make sure you're in it for the long run. But, yeah. but then along the way, like I said, I, I do the questionnaire at least every three months. Okay. That way I can judge. Maybe they're, maybe they're just moving, they're progressing. Maybe they're doing things that they should be doing. You know, some people, you know, they'll, they'll go out, they'll get on the ketogenic diet or they'll get on the, you know, the, the, the grain free and, and gluten free and, and dairy free diet right away. And some people will still eat Twinkies, you know, and, and so their progress is going to take a lot longer. So, you know, I definitely look at the prog the progress they're making as far as, you know, do we need to continue trying to detox for heavy metals or or detox in general, or do we just need to go kind of on a, on a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. schedule? Do you, um, do you have any suggestions for 
identifying lead that might be in body care pot products or people just need to do the deeper work of yeah. um, you know, you looking beyond the label and and checking what the product is and how clean it really is. Yeah, the problem with personal care products is they don't have to put the ingredients in, especially like, 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 like for instance, uh, um, and I love uh, balsamic vinegar, but most balsamic vinegars that are tested have lead in them. So, you know, you, so they, there's actually some that actually put on the label that they're lead-free. They test their, their balsamic vinegar. Yeah. Uh, so there's, with the most things, there's just really no way of knowing. The Environmental Working Group has a list of, of, yeah. of things that you can look at, and I would go on. They, they rate... Yeah. They rank personal care products, and it's a very long list to look at. But, too. but yeah, other than, you know, finding, you know, some sort of you know, article or something that tells you specifically if this thing was tested for lead or not, you're not really actually. Okay. The, uh, the comment in here about um, a company called Quicksilver Labs that tests for urine, um, blood, and hair somebody wants that that um and i think it's great i've never used it um but i think it's great because it, it kind of helps you get a gauge you know if they if they're you know the blood i would always expect to be zero if, it, if it's if there's elevated levels in the blood then i know the person is in a state of 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 exposure you know they're being exposed if it's lead maybe they've got lead pipes in their house if it's mercury they've got amalgam fillings or maybe they just got a flu shot or something like that um so it i think it'd be the ideal would be to do all three of them you know, ideal would be to do one regular urine catch and then another one that's challenged with DMSA and then to do a blood and then to do hair because then you get an idea of, you know, are they excreting this stuff through their hair? Are they still being exposed? Is it in their blood? So, yeah, I think doing all three is great. I never do, but, you know, it's because yes. most people don't want to pay for it. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. So what I'm concerned with more than anything is what's your body burden, not how much yes. you're excreting or anything else, but it's but it would be good to know. It's fascinating. I think it's great. We're going to have to look and see if our um, Alex will check this. We'll look at it early this this week to see about um, systemic systemic formulas and our students, graduates, being able to order directly from them. But I'm hopeful since you are, Sean. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sure they would be. You know, especially if someone's got a master's degree or a, a, a PhD. Yeah, that's not going to be. You know, they 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 are a practitioner um, uh, only, but. You know, they also look at, you know, what is your experience? You know, I, I was really fortunate because I had been using them under the guidance of a doctor for years that they, yeah. you know, when I set out on my own, they were like, yeah, of course you can keep using yeah. more about our products than most of the doctors that use it here. So, you know, I was really fortunate that, that I was able to, to continue with that. But, but you know, someone going through a university like yours, they shouldn't have any problem at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, It's just a follow up about the um, the implants. It's like if you're going to go for implants, Libby went ahead and got the implants, but the cost was outrageous. Yeah. And then there's questions about the metal that's used for the screw to fix the tooth implant, tooth implant, and what's happening there. And yeah, it's, it's, it's you know if it was if it was the tooth all the way in the back, let's say I would have it pulled and then just call it a day. You know, mm -hmm. um, the problem with having a tooth that's got another tooth behind it is the back teeth, let's say you pull out one of your eye teeth, for instance, you know, just because we all know where those are, the teeth behind it are slowly gonna migrate their way forward. They're gonna cl they want to close in that gap. And so it's gonna cause bite problems and all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, I would I would rather risk, you know, the problem with titanium and maybe having a mild reaction to that as opposed to being chronic exposed okay. to mercury. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they do have ceramic implants now, and they've got their issues too, but that's another topic. We'll have um, Dr. Marianne Chalmers come in and talk to us all about biological yeah. dentistry for that. Yeah. Yeah, and it, but it I'm going to end the, on... Oh, go ahead. Nothing. I'm going to close this out with the last question. We want to know how to learn how to use proper, properly use, Sean, the uh, systemic formulas detox system. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> like I said, you can contact me. Um, I, I'd be happy to show you how, to, how it works and, and talk you through it. Uh, you know, there's some people over at Cyto, or it's a True Cellular Detox that I can introduce you to as well. But, uh, um, but yeah, you know, I'd be happy. We could do a, a class on it. We could do, you know, there's a lot of options. But if you well, this is the kind of thing, if we, if, we, if we get a group together, um, 
then we can coordinate something and not yeah. just be having it be you know one person at a time. So sure, yeah. sure, yeah. If, if, if there's enough interest that we can yeah. put enough people together to do a webinar on how true cellular <laughs> detox works and, and how to implement it in your practice, absolutely. <laughs> there's some very positive response on this. So <laughs> okay, all right. Cool. We'll follow cool. up on that. I just <laughs> want to say, Sean, there's a tremendous amount of positive feedback for this presentation, for the information that's shared, and 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 urging for more. So this was a great topic, very well done in terms of your presentation and the information that you shared. I thank you all for staying for the end. And I just have a couple little things to say about what's coming up next. A reminder that this was recorded. Both the recording and the PowerPoint will be up for for um, you to review later. There's going to be a survey to fill out after this ends. Please help us. Um, I look at your feedback and comments. Um, it matters to us. So our next webinar is um, August 1st with Lucinda Curran, and she's going to be addressing mold and your health. Oh, from, oh from, my gosh, uh, that's, that's, I'm going to be on that. That's exciting. She, she's a building biologist out of Australia, and um, so, yeah, she talks about toxic building a lot. Plus, and, she's going to have a cool accent. <laughs> yeah, right. Exact, exactly. That's exactly right. And then on August 2nd, we've got All About Alumni with Margie Andrews presenting Evolving My Practice. So that's all I can tell you today. This is going to bring this to a conclusion. Thank you again, Sean, for everything. Paul, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for staying for the duration and sharing this educational experience with us. Absolutely. I, as always, I wish you all the best of health. I look forward to learning more together at Hawthorne University's webinar and all about alumni and anywhere we can find each other. So until we're back here again in a couple weeks, take care everybody.